Okay. And play from yeah. thanks everybody. Thanks for taking part in this day, this whole conference, this program. Thanks for taking part in this whole day uh, exercise for my workshop as well. I'm going to cover uh, some of the territory that Andrew covered earlier in his plenary. Uh, as Rich and I were saying, Rich and I have played tag team on this any number of times, and we both refer to each other's work regularly, and uh, we're very excited about this. My name's Phil Arco. I'm the coordinator of what we call the National Link Coalition, and the link refers to the areas where child abuse and maltreatment, uh, elder abuse, domestic violence, and animal cruelty are linked and they come together. And by focusing on that link, we connect the dots. And we recognize that all forms of family violence are connected, that animal cruelty is not an outlier, it's not an isolated event. And that it often, but not always, but it often predicts uh, or precedes or follows other forms of family violence. And by integrating the animal protection and animal control agencies in the community into the human services network, I call bridging the humane human gap, sort of services gap, we can make a lot more progress in protecting um, vulnerable children, uh, women, and, uh, and elders. There's my email address or my email address for the coalition, our website, phone number if you need to reach me. Uh, I'll have that again at the end. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how I got here and what the coalition does. I'm going to focus more on the child protection aspect of this, but I will go into um, other aspects of the link as well. I got here through a circuitous route. I started out as a newspaper reporter, and through a fluke, I wound up as the communications officer and PR guy for the Humane Society of the Pikes Peak region in Colorado Springs, Colorado, way back in 1973. And I was going around town talking to kids uh, raising money, doing all sorts of humane things. And I had a couple of light bulb moments, as I call them, uh, back in the 1980s that put this whole issue on my radar screen. It wasn't just me. There were a number of others of us who were thinking along similar lines. One of them was a research study that came from my alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania. And a woman in the School of Social Work did a study, and she looked at a year's worth of data from a county just north of Philadelphia. She looked at data from the SPCA, the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals and the Child Protection Agency, and found that 9% of the cases they overlapped. They were dealing with the same families, the same perps, the same ideology of, of family violence, but they weren't talking to each other. They were in silos. And there was a huge irony of that. As Andrew just mentioned at the end of his program, the humane movement gave birth to the child protection movement. And I looked at that irony and said, why aren't these agencies talking together? What's wrong with this picture? About the same time, I was doing an in-service training for some veterinarians in Colorado Springs. And at the time, I was the delegate from the Humane Movement to the American Veterinary Medical Association's Animal Welfare Committee. And I saw 60,000 veterinarians in the country then, there are a lot more now, um, who were not getting paid as much as physicians, who were not getting the same regard that a physician gets. and I asked the veterinarian there, I said, Doc, every teacher in this room is mandated by Colorado state law to report child abuse. I know everybody in human health has to as well. What about veterinarians? Do you have to report suspected child abuse? He thought a minute and said, no. Uh, he said, no, as a matter of fact, I would. Uh, in fact, Colorado was the only state in the country that specifically mandated veterinarians as reporters of child abuse. In 49 states, it wasn't on their radar screen. I said, wow, that's interesting. Said, let me take that one step further. Would you report animal cruelty to us at the Humane Society where we were the investigating agency? He said, no, why would I ever want to do that? I might lose a client. And I thought, boy, what's really wrong with that picture? Shouldn't the veterinarian be as proactive in preventing animal abuse as physicians are in preventing child abuse? And then I did an a after dinner speech for a local domestic violence agency. And while I was waiting to go on, I looked at their newsletter and there on page three, were four drawings that had been drawn by the children in the shelter. And I had two light bulb moments. One was it had honestly never occurred to me as somebody outside the domestic violence field that when a woman flees domestic violence, she's going to take her kids with her. It never occurred to me there might be kids in the shelter. The second one, which really caught my attention, was that there were four drawings on that page and three of them were pictures of animals that had been hurt or killed or threatened by daddy or mommy's abusive boyfriend as a way to warn them that they could be next. And that if they didn't uh, obey him, 
the animals would be threatened and was used as leverage, as a coercive tool to keep that whole family hostage and keep them from escaping. And I thought, wow, this is a whole aspect of animal abuse we've never thought about. We'll move forward 40 years. <laughs> and in 2008, 25 of us got together and we created this National Resource Center. Uh, we're the National Resource Center on the link between animal abuse and human violence. Again, there's our website or email address. There are lots of free resources on our website. We publish a free monthly newsletter called the Link Letter. If you'd like to um, subscribe to that, just send me an email. Make sure your uh, what agency you're with is in your signature. We've got 4,900 people in all 50 states and 55 countries who read it. It's free. There's no charge for this. Uh, we focus on four main areas. We look at public policy, and I'm going to be talking about these all today. Public policy, we showcase great programs, we build public and professional awareness, and we back it up with academic research. We have over 1,700 citations uh, and references in our bibliography. Uh, we create local humane coalitions, and our goal in this is a species-spanning approach to make our communities safer. A couple of things I'm going to talk about today. First, this is all polyvictimization. And our motto for this is very simple. When animals are abused, children are at risk. And when children are abused, animals are at risk. We're not saying animals are more important than kids. We're saying that in a civilized society, no vulnerable family member should be put at risk. Secondly, animal abuse, whether it's committed or even witnessed by a child, can be a precursor to becoming an abusive adult. And there's lots of research on the fact that abusive events in childhood can escalate. In fact, uh, animal cruelty is one of the earliest indicators of conduct disorder. It starts showing up at about the age of six and a half. Third, the abuse of animals in a family can be a very strong signal that that child is also a victim of abuse. The emotional significance of pets in children's lives or even wildlife or, or livestock can be significant, but it's often underestimated or not acknowledged, and we really don't have accurate numbers on that, uh, unfortunately. But I'll give you some examples here to show you how significant that can be. And finally, connecting the dots. We can no longer think of animal abuse and child abuse as isolated incidents. The link connects the dots. And we take this siloed diagram where everybody in these four fields is operating independently. And this is the model we use now, uh, which is the fact that they overlap and anybody working in any one of these areas can see multiple forms of family violence. And they don't have to be an expert on it. It's a case of, you know, if you see something, say something. Somebody at the at Andrew's workshop asked, you know, do the police know how to recognize child, child abuse? Not often, not really, okay? But, you know, simple things that would cause them or anybody else to say, you might want to look at it, should be reported. Well, it's the same thing with all four forms of family violence. And if we recognize animal abuse, that something else is going on in the household, that can be the first step in stopping the cycle of violence. And in fact, animal abuse rarely occurs in a vacuum. There's almost always something going on. If you think back of your own, on your own childhood, if we had more time, I'd have you tell you know, stories of what you remember. And by the way, if you have questions, put them in the chat box. I'll try to get to them at the end. Um, the fact is most children are raised with pets or in farm country, they have livestock and they may have pets as well. And they become a pivotal point of how we identify our childhoods and our childhood memories. And they last with us for a lifetime. And I could tell you stories about visiting uh, elderly people in, in long-term care facilities who flash back 80 years to their childhood when they see a pet. Pets are also a particularly unique source of comfort and a confidant in a household where there's chaos and turmoil and abuse going on. So if you think back of, you know, in your own childhood, of your own experiences, translate that into the kids you're working with and recognize that whatever positive or negative experiences they're having with their animals now will last with them for decades to come. And there are a lot of pets out there. People outside the animal shelter field don't recognize that. Um, Minnesota is a great example. There are about five, 0.7 million people in the state. I love Minnesota, been there any number of times. There's a little more than 1 million children in Minnesota, but there's also about 1 million dogs and about 1 million cats. So combined, there are more dogs and cats in Minnesota than there are children. And that is not surprising at all. 
And in fact, more than one third of Minnesota households have dogs and almost and more than one quarter have cats. That's significant because dogs and cats don't vote, but their owners do. And so we tell legislators, you know, um, if you care about animal welfare, it's not just, it's not an animal rights issue. It's the fact that the animal abuse hurts people. It's a public safety issue. It's a public health issue. You're helping save other vulnerable members of the families. I get particularly concerned when we're dealing with children who, or for that matter, uh, caseworkers and child protective agencies who don't have those positive pet attachments, who were not raised with, with pets, who just don't know that cuddly feeling of being able to snuggle up with a friendly, unconditionally regarding uh, pet. We see this a lot, unfortunately, in minority communities or inner city areas where the rates of pet ownership are significantly lower than among the, than the white population. Great book about this, which I love, um, is called uh, Last Child in the Woods, Richard, written by Richard Louvre. Um, the subtitle is Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. Animals are friendly ambassadors from the natural world and they calm us down and they lower our blood pressure. And I teach animal assisted therapy courses and talk about the good side of the human animal bond. Uh, kids who don't get this positive experience with nature and the companion animals are a part of that or their livestock are a part of that are missing a huge piece. And it's a global phenomenon. I have been uh, show you a couple of examples of that. One in the middle, I was doing some lecturing in Japan a couple of years back. I went to the Tokyo Children's Museum um, and saw this, it's a young child on an interactive screen. There's the mother there. And if you look above the screen, the name of this uh, game is Nature Contact. And when children have to go to a video screen to get contact with nature, you know, or if they're driving through Yosemite or, or Glacier National Park in the back seat of the SUV, playing their you know video games, watching the screens, and not looking at the natural beauty, we're in trouble. One on the right is a full-page newspaper ad for Comcast about you know how you can get Wi-Fi in more places. It's a couple of kids in a pup tent in the backyard, but what are they doing? They're, they're watching a screen. Oh man! What do we know about pets and families? There are a lot of them, as I said. And who cares for them? Overwhelmingly, they're in households with children. Uh, more than two thirds of homes with children under age six and almost three quarters of homes with children over age six have pets. That's the market. That's the demographics for pet ownership. And who cares for those animals is overwhelmingly the woman of the household. That's significant for veterinarians because who's the vet gonna see on Saturday morning? Well, it's gonna be the wife, the mother bringing fluffy in for the rabies shots with a couple of kids in tow. So veterinarians can conceivably see three of the primary uh, potential victims for family violence. Link got here through a long process. Back in 1964, great anthropologist Margaret Mead was writing that, you know, therapists should watch for any child killing or torturing animals as an early diagnostic sign to deter children from a long career of episodic violence and murder. In the 1970s, this was popular in psych uh, textbooks. You may have come across this. It was called the McDonald Triad. Excuse me, one study found that, you know, many murderers had early childhood histories of fire setting, bedwetting, and, and animal abuse. They seem to overlook. That theory's kind of going by the wayside right now, but it's still out there. In the 1980s, we started looking at serial killers in the tangled web of multiple forms of, of violence. And lo and behold, many of them did in fact uh, start out torturing animals, but not all of them, okay? In the 1990s had the first round of these awful school shootings. The early research showed that 43% of them were uh, had histories of torturing animals. Today, the number's closer to 10%, uh, as unfortunately we've gotten more data points with, with the more cases. It's about 10% which is still a highly significant risk factor and a red flag. In the 2000s, we started looking at social capital, which is how animals improve community health, that sense of connectivity. We really saw this with COVID, with animals forcing us to get out of our houses and meet our neighbors across the, the street, um, or the you know doggy park has replaced the, the village green. The National Link Coalition came along to start putting all this together. On the 2010s, we started looking at animals uh, cruelty being linked with bullying, with histories of corporal punishment, even with terrorism, and now we're up to the present time. 
but there are some gaps in the system, and particularly when it comes to children. You may be familiar with the ACEs study, which described adverse childhood experiences. It was done by the Centers for Disease Control. And they looked at 17,000 participants over a 19 year period. And they found that early childhood adverse experiences are big risk factors. They cause toxic stress. They harm the developing brain architecture. They make children uh, hyper-responsive over the long-term to perceived threats. And it causes them to adopt risky health behaviors. So it's not just the emotional distress that can last a lifetime, but also the physical health problems, which can lead to worse health and even earlier death, okay? But nowhere in the ACEs study did they even think about including a child's exposure to or committing animal cruelty as an adverse childhood experience. That's a huge gap in the system. Another gap is the fact that child protective workers in many states routinely forget to include not only animal, potential animal abuse, but even dangerous animals in the child's environment. And I've done training for child welfare workers and they go into the house and I say, do you even look for you know, animals that might threaten the child? And they say, no, because if it's a dangerous animal, I'm gonna get bit. That's a worker's comp claim. Besides my desk is piled up. I got too, too much of a caseload. I can't handle all this. So they ask that the animal be put into another room. And I say, what's wrong with that picture? So we need to be training child protective workers to routinely look for not only potential animal abuse, but also potentially dangerous animals. And I know of several cases, I'll share one of them with you here, of children who were under invest whose families were under investigation by CPS, um, who were killed by snakes or dogs in the household. Here's one of those cases. It was in Brooklyn, New York. Um, uh, next door neighbor said it was a tragedy waiting to happen. Uh, family. The woman's boyfriend had a cane corso. This is an Italian mastiff. It's the kind of dog that would eat a pit bull for lunch. Um, and they had lived in the apartment for three years. They had parrots, other dogs, uh, turtles, and fish, okay? But the, the boyfriend would attack train this dog out in the street with a big protective guard under his, over his arm. And everybody would run and flee when he came out there. They were all petrified uh, of this dog. And the dog had killed the rabbit in the household and left everything on the floor. He said it was like the Bronx Zoo in there. And this is what caught my attention. Somebody from the Child Welfare Agency had been to the past, but for something minor, but nothing involving the dog. And again, this goes back to this irony. Child protection, animal protection came together. They split off into silos. Why aren't they coming back together again? There are several ways to fix this gap in the system. And I think it may be up more to groups like uh, prevent child abuse or you know safe passage or the, the nonprofit agencies outside the government system uh, to be able to correct these gaps. Maybe easier to do that. One is to recognize that pets are members of the family. And when social workers or human service workers or anybody working with, with families think of the family, this might be the model that they see and the pets are on the periphery. Oh, you, if pets are there, how nice. Let me deal with what I'm dealing with. We need to change that model and to switch from this to this. And once we start thinking of a family as including pets, an awful lot of pieces of the puzzle start coming together. There's a uh, diagram that's used in social work. It's called a genogram. It is a, it's not a genealogy chart, but it's a map of the emotional relationships that people in a household have for three generations. And we have a couple of models of this that now include the animals and the emotional connections, the human animal bonds that people in the family have with their animals. And uh, there's a resource, research on it, I can give you that. Just email me, I can get you all this information. But we should routinely be including pets in the geogram and the diagram of relationships in a, in a household. Um, animal abuse is the dark side of the human animal bond. It's the tip of the iceberg. And whoever is investigating animal child or uh, animal child domestic violence elder abuse, you know, is often seeing multiple forms of it. And the animal abuse is often the first to come forward because much of this occurs outdoors where the neighbors can see it and they know that the dog can't pick up the phone and dial 911 himself. We've identified eight types of links. 
Uh, the most prevalent is this domestic violence link. It's all part of the same mechanism of power and control. It's usually a man abusing a woman, but we have women who abuse men and we have intimate partner violence and same sex relationships, but I'm just gonna keep it simple for space of time. Um, he's warning her that she could be next um, and consequently she doesn't escape. We have any number of studies. I just came across one yesterday and the data is really mixed. It ranges anywhere from 1% to 89% of women say in domestic violence situations say that there was animal abuse. More common studies is somewhere between 18% and 48%. Whatever the number, it's a lot. It's coercive control, it's a form of emotional extortion. And consequently, millions of women and children and their pets are threatened by being forced to stay in that toxic relationship. There are many other reasons why she doesn't leave, obviously, but this is a big barrier. We have the same phenomenon in child sexual abuse where the abuser warns the little boy or girl that if they talk, he'll strangle her bunny. And now this child is dealing with multiple layers of anxiety and grief and confusion and fear and physical and emotional trauma and now has to worry about her rabbit as well. The adverse childhood experiences, as I mentioned, that gap in the system, again, again, it's one of the earliest indicators of conduct disorder and it starts showing up at about the age of six and a half. I mentioned bullying. It's not just youths who bully others who you would expect to be more aggressive towards animals, but youths who have been bullied transfer that negative energy that's been directed to them against animals. They take it out on the pets. We have animal hoarding. It's a huge intractable issue. Recidivism rate is 100%. It can affect any age group, but it tends to be more an elderly population, elderly women who are isolated. And so it's linked with other issues affecting seniors. We have dog fighting and cock fighting, which are frequently linked with homicides, drug trafficking, sex trafficking, narcotics, weapons, uh, racketeering, and many other crimes above and beyond having people witnessing animals fight to the death. The animal sexual abuse issue, um, it's often linked, well, we need to talk to you about that. There are a lot of people who prefer to have sex with animals. And there's a lot of garbage online where people can connect and there are online porn, animal porn videos. And there's a market for people trading the animals in the videos back and forth. Um, and it's very frequently linked with child pornography and wide range of other sex crimes against people. And whenever we have um, an animal sex abuse raid, we almost always find child pornography as well. And then the school shootings and the mass shootings, like I said, current figure is about 10% of them have animal abuse histories as well. Andrew mentioned uh, Henry Berg founding the ASPCA in 1866 and a mere eight years later intervened to rescue little Mary Ellen uh, Wilson and humane societies for the next 80 years, uh, all, actually the next 90 years, uh, often had this dual function of protecting animals and children together. But that split off with the creation of CAPTA, the Child Abuse Protection and Treatment Act in 1971, which I trace back to the publication of the Battered Child Syndrome article in 1962 in the Journal of the American Medical Association which put child abuse, which previously had just been called accident prone children, okay, into the realm of a medical condition that was preventable and had the cachet of the American Medical Association. And it got the medical profession behind it and it got government to create the health and human services and state child protective network that we have today. Why should we routinely ask about children's experiences with animals? Because it's a common denominator in most children's lives. I refer this book to you as well. It's written by Gail Nelson. She retired from the School of Education at Purdue a number of years ago. It's called Why the Wild Things Are. Not where, why. Um, where the Wild Things, of course, is Maurice Sendak's great book. And she did some great research. She found that children's literature and media are saturated with pets. And it's the books they read, the comic books, the TV shows, the video games, the mobiles hanging over the cribs, the imprints on their pajamas, you name it. She found that of the first 50 words that children speak, once they get past mama and dada, it's doggy and ducky and kitty and horsey. Uh, she did a content analysis of fairy tales and found fairy tales have more animals in them than fairies. She found that 80 to 90% of children experience their first loss through the death or disappearance of a pet rather than say a grandparent. And this one is the one that scares me. She found that a child in America today 
is more likely to grow up with pets than with a live at home father. So think of the implications of that for anybody working with kids. If they're not asking about the pets, how many there are, how many they've had, how they're being treated, who's attached to them, are they abused? Do they come and go so there's no attachment or are they stable and their emotional attachments? If you're not asking about that, think of the pieces of the puzzle you're missing. Children talk to their pets and they talk about their pets before they'll talk about their own issues. When a child or abused woman is going in for any kind of treatment or investigation or servicing, their barriers are up, they're scared, they're nervous. If you ask about their pets, those barriers come down. And it's a safe, neutral topic that can build immediate rapport and trust and show that you care. And that is, the animals are a mirror into the child's life and what's going on in the household. And it's a window into their world. It fills in the pieces of the puzzle. Um, and we recommend asking just these three simple questions. They're open-ended and they get a response. Are there animals at home? How are they cared for? And are you worried about their welfare? And see what the child says. Um, you may find there are no pets, you may find there are no uh, problems, but on the other hand, you may get a real interesting insight into that child's ecosystem. It can be highly significant. Kirby Wyckoff was at the Milton Hershey School in Pennsylvania. She said 70 to 80% of our population, this is a residential treatment center for uh, emotionally abused kids, so 70 to 80% of our population has a significant trauma history. There's something very powerful and chilling about sitting with a child who can't directly articulate that she's been a victim of abuse. But when you ask about the family pets, they'll share with you that in a drunken rage, their uncle threw the kitten out of a fourth floor window, where the teenage boy who fought, whose father pulled the tail nose off, toenails off the dogs to get back at the sun. The link is real. I've sat in a room with kids and families where the link tells you more about the family unit than any individual family member can or will. Just asking about animals in the home has often yielded much more than many other clinical assessment tools. Chris Risley, work at, uh, Risley Curtis, uh, retired from the School of Social Work at Arizona State. She shared this case with me, and this is not an unusual one at all. She said, I have a youth who's been abused at her home, but, and she wants to return there because she thinks her cat is the only one who loves her. She rescued the cat from an abusive home, and she thinks that the cat tries to keep her father away from her. We see that over and over again with children whose pets warn them about daddy or mommy's boyfriend's midnight raids on their room. She would move to another home or anywhere else instead of running away if she had her cat. Kids are really drawn to their animals. They will confide their secrets and their fears and angers to their pets and abuse kids are more likely to do that. And in a chaotic home, that pet with an unconditional regard may be the only buffer, the only support, the only connectivity that that child has against everything else that's going on all around him or her. The child's fascination with animals doesn't have to be taught. It's natural, it's innate. Kids are primed to respond with some feeling. It could be attraction, fascination, fear, disgust, but a dog in particular is a conversation waiting to happen. And with kids, any animal is a conversation waiting to happen. And, you know, it's just natural for all kids. And again, as I said, because the barriers are up, animals slip in under the radar of, of human defense mechanisms and an animal's presence and open a window into that person's or that family's underlying issues. I mentioned Chris Risley Curtis before, She's written extensively about this. She found many children turn to their pets for reassurance and emotional support during stress. Pets can help kids feel secure and a sense of unconditional love, can aid their cognitive and language development. They can be sentinels of unsafe environmental conditions. And it's a subsystem within a complex family system, including questions and observations about current and past presence of animals in their environment, the meaning they have for each family member, their care, whether they've been hurt or killed, can be important to effective family-centered practice. And she says, if it doesn't matter if you as a social worker are animal friendly, if your clients are, it's an issue. Addressing animal issues is one more way to help humans, but if you don't look and you don't ask, you won't know.
couple of reality checks here. First, not all childhood animal abusers grow up to be psychopaths. Just because the kid kicked the cat doesn't mean he's going to grow up to become another Jeffrey Dahmer. But he might. Some kids who are surrounded by violence seek comfort in their animals and try to protect them rather than take out that anger against them. And because so many risk assessment instruments don't even think about including the animal questions, and animal cruelty isn't often included in crime reports and handled by different agencies, the risk is often underestimated. So we need to have more cross-fertilization, cross-reporting between those agencies. And I think Andrew was talking about that earlier. Animal abuse doesn't always lead to human violence. And this was a classic study in Massachusetts, looking at people who'd been arrested for animal cruelty. And was tr they tracked their criminal records for 10 years before and 10 years afterwards to see if they had any other crimes, matched them with a control group, Okay, and they expected that the animal abusers were more likely to have other crimes and that the animal abuse came first and then the human crimes came later as part of the graduation hypothesis as it's called in psychology. Well, the first part was true. The animal abusers were much more likely to have other crimes, 70% of them did, compared to the control group who were not animal abusers. But the second part was different. They found that in the majority of cases, the crimes against people came first. So rather than necessarily being a graduation hypothesis, which it can be, more than likely it's called a pattern of general deviance. It's just part of an overall pattern of antisocial behaviors. And we know that animal abuse doesn't always lead to human violence, but it often does, and we shouldn't be surprised when we find this link. And we also have to have a realistic view that the home environment on everything else that's going on may be a better predictor of the development of adult violence. We shouldn't infer, infer that animal cruelty always leads to other antisocial behavior. The context in which it occurs and other behavioral problems, you know, all obviously play a huge, a very significant role. One of the earliest studies on this is a classic. It was in New Jersey, looking at families um, that were under investigation by family services for child abuse. 60% of them had uh, abused or neglected pets. And when it was a case of physical child abuse, the rate of animal abuse was a whopping 88%. That is an enormous risk factor. Several other things came out of this study. Uh, one was that two thirds of the animal abuse was perpetrated by the fathers or the boyfriends, but one third was by the children themselves. Also, there are 11 times more dog bites in these households. The animals fought back the only way they could with their teeth. So in addition to the emotional abuse, we've got the physical trauma. We have a rabies threat. We have a public health risk as well. And it turned out that these families where there was child abuse and uh, domestic and animal abuse going on, tended to see veterinarians at pretty much the same rate as non-abusive households. So when veterinarians say, I'm never gonna see an abused child, they will. They just don't know it yet, okay? We have to reach out to veterinarians. We also have had massive studies in Colorado looking at child abuse and domestic violence connectivity uh, and the implications there. We have lots of studies linking animal abuse and child sexual abuse. As I said before, um, survivors of child sexual abuse often reveal that threats and abuse of their pets are used to ensure their silence and force them to choose their own between their own victimization and the pet's death. Uh, kids who've been sexually abused are five times more likely to abuse animals. Why do people abuse animals? Short answer is there are as many reasons for this as there is for interpersonal violence. Uh, longer answer, many times just ignorance. They don't know any better. They don't empathize with the animals. They come from a culture where abuse is the norm. They don't have coping skills. And you know the animals pooping on the carpet is just the last straw. It's a way to gain coercive control and revenge against her, retaliation against the family or friends who help her escape. And we find that the abusers talk about it, they brag about it because they think it makes them sound more macho that they can hurt the animals. They do it because they can, do it because the animals are convenient, they're very soft targets. They do it because they think the cops won't care and unfortunately in many cases they are all too right. And frankly, they do it because it works. It's an extremely effective technique. They'll do it to control the animal. It's just inappropriate uh, behavior modification. And then there are the psychopaths out there that enhances their sense of aggressiveness or even their sexual gratification. Why do children 
abuse animals for all those reasons, plus some others. One of our poster boys here is Nicholas Cruz from Parkland, Florida, who was just sentenced yesterday. Uh, I think Bob, uh, Andrew was talking about the, the Buffalo shooter. Um, the children may hurt animals uh, just out of, out of curiosity. They just don't know any better. They, it's a way to relieve their boredom or their sense of depression. And we get really scared when they take videos of that to re see those videos when they get depressed. They'll react because they're afraid of the animal or they're imitating what they see the grownups around them do. We've had cases of kids smothering their pets to protect them from being tortured by the abuser in the household. We have had cases of kids harming animals to reenact their own abuse. It's a way for them to regain a sense of power after they've been abused. And worst case scenario, it's a dress rehearsal for interpersonal violence. Does animal abuse always lead to human violence? No, often, but not always. We know that kids' aggressive behavior can be stable and pretty predictable by the age of eight and often is transmitted across the generations, often predicts any social behavior. And like I said, animal abuse is one of the earliest signs of conduct disorder, but we don't know whether it's causal or correlational. Is it the graduation hypothesis or just part of pattern of general deviance or in the context of the home environment and abusive experiences or something else or all of the above? It's very complex. We talk a little bit about animal abuse and domestic violence. Um, researchers were trying to identify the four greatest risk factors for who might become a domestic violence abuser. And they identified four. Three were not surprising. History of substance abuse. Somebody asked about substance abuse earlier. Substance abuse is one of the biggest risk factors for domestic violence, low education levels, and history of mental illness. But the fourth factor that they hadn't thought about was this history of actual or threatened animal abuse. It's one of the four biggest risk factors for domestic violence. A study in Alberta, Canada found that children who've been exposed to domestic violence are three times more likely to be cruel to animals. They take that violence around them and they translate it to somebody lower on the totem pole. I mentioned earlier how many battered women and kids delay leaving uh, because of they're afraid what will happen um, to their animals. Animal abuse is 11 times more common in homes where there's domestic violence than in non-abusive homes. Uh, this abuse always occur, almost always occurs in the presence of women and children as a way to intimidate and control them. Um, study in Utah found 32% of women in shelters said their children had harmed the animals. Um, Andrew Campbell probably mentioned these. I didn't have a chance to see all this program. Uh, but I cite his research all the time. He found intimate partner in, uh, violence suspects uh, with histories of pet abuse are far more lethal, far, use far more dangerous uh, control techniques. There are many more incidents. I think the national average right now is it takes seven times before she finally gets the, up the courage to be able to leave for good. Andrew found when there's domestic violence, there can be as many as 50 prior incidents before she leaves. And the risk to first responders doubles when animal abuse is thrown into the equation. Uh, he found that victims report that the domestic violence is much more dangerous and hands-on and physical with prior incidents being strangled, sexual uh, date rape, and 80% of these women fear for their lives, they're afraid they're gonna get killed. One of the most recent studies on this came from the National Domestic Violence Hotline, working with the Urban Resource Institute in New York. This was the first study that uh, question people calling the hotline as opposed to women who are already in shelter. And you can see the numbers there, dramatic numbers of how many women say keeping pets is important with them in whether they're going to stay with a guy or leave. Half of them won't leave if they can't take their pets with them. Almost half said they were afraid the abuser would harm or kill the pets. 30% said the kids were aware of this. And almost three quarters of these women were not aware that there are in fact pet friendly shelters out there. And I'll talk about that here shortly. This is what the intergenerational cycle of violence looks like. The abuser harms or threatens the animals, the survivors stay, the kids are exposed to all this, the kids become violent or victims themselves and they grow up and they repeat the pattern all over again. You may or may not be familiar with the Duluth model as it's called developed in Minnesota <laughs> um, by domestic violence agency up uh, north. Um, 
back in the 80s or 90s, I can't remember when it came out, showing that domestic violence wasn't just physical abuse, it's really power and control. And there are these eight manifestations of it within that power and control model. We've adapted that to show how the animal abuse fits into it. There's this sense of isolation. He'll refuse to allow her to take the pet to the vet or to go to the doggy park where she can socialize with other people and their pets. There's emotional abuse. He'll call her bitch. The pet will just disappear one day. And that takes away the only source of comfort and unconditional love she has. He'll force her to watch animal pornography or demean her by making her drink out of the dog food dish. Economic abuse, he controls the purse strings. He'll refuse to let her spend money at the vet on the animal's care and then blame her when the animal gets sick. The intimidation factor already mentioned that, you know, next time I did it to your cat, next time it'll be you. The kids get dragged into this. He'll harm the pets, blame it on mommy, and use that to try to drive a wedge between her and the kids. He'll deny it, blame somebody else like he does for everything else. There's legal abuse, threatening to take the pet away. Pets are property and are likely to remain so for the foreseeable future. So in a custody dispute, as a result of the brutal you know, divorce and, and domestic violence, who's gonna get custody of that animal because it is property? I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so we have these different models there. Briefly about elder abuse, people working with seniors uh, run into several stereotypical situations. Uh, because they're physically frail, uh, psychological limitations, cognitive deficits, lack of funding, lack of transportation, the animals can be harmed as well. We have cases where because of those conditions, the pets get neglected or their self-neglect. They'll spend what limited resources they have on their pets, but not themselves. So they won't go into a hospital or long-term care because there's nobody care for their pets. Animal hoarding, like I said, can be any age group, but it tends to be older women. The emotional attachment to that pet can be pernicious, could be extremely deep because this pet may be the last link to a loved one who passed away. It could be the only uh, excuse she has to get up and get out of the house and go for a walk. It could be the only reason to get up in the morning and a sense of purpose and responsibility to feed the animal, to clean the litter box or whatever. There's a safety issue. Not only could she trip and fall over the animal, but caseworkers tell us they won't go into a house that's overrun with rats and cockroaches because the dog food tins have piled up in the sink for weeks at a time or the litter box has never been changed. We have emotional uh, financial control and coercive issues there. I remember, recall one case in Rhode Island, a guy held his elderly mother's cat hostage for $20,000 in ransom money. And we have issues affecting the disabled uh, population as well, where the partner is jealous of the other partner's not only attachment, but you know, desperate need uh, for that service animal. So with all that as a background, what's being done? And what can you as child advocates do about this? Well, the first thing is we, the link changes the focus about animal protection laws away from animal welfare and animal rights into recognizing it's a human safety issue, which is a lesson that legislators on every level understand and accept. Back when we started talking about this in the early 1990s, only five states had felony level animal cruelty laws. Today, all 50 do. Doesn't necessarily mean they're enforced. Doesn't necessarily mean there are adequate agencies out there to do the job, but at least the laws are on the books. We now have 38 states, including Minnesota, in which courts can specifically include pets in domestic violence protection orders. We call them pet protection orders. Minnesota, this process started in Maine in 2006. Minnesota came along in 2010. We now have 38 states where pets can be included. Um, in 2018, the feds came on board passing the Pet and Women's Safety Act, the PAWS Act, which says these pet protection orders can be enforced across state lines. And it's also allocating $3 million a year for two domestic violence shelters to help them become pet friendly, to build the facilities to house survivors animals as well. Um, we have 11 states now um, on, on the left there in which an act of coercive animal abuse in this domestic violence context is also defined as an act of domestic violence or dating violence or stalking. So this case can be prosecuted as either animal cruelty or domestic violence or both. Map on the right shows the six states. This is one of the newest developments. Uh, this started in Alaska in 2016. 
six states where courts can specifically award custody of pets in a divorce settlement based on the animal's best interest, following the child abuse, child protection model, what's going to be in the best interest for the child. Well, six states now, we can do it for the animals as well. And we'd love to see Minnesota, as socially progressive as Minnesota has always been, join, uh, join the, the group there. Sex with animals is a pernicious problem. Like I said, it used to be pretty common. It's now illegal in 48 states as a result of this awareness here. And that's been a major step forward. For some bizarre reason, West Virginia and New Mexico were still holdouts. Um, way back when I asked that veterinarian, would you have to report animal abuse to me? And he said, no, I might lose a client. Well, that has changed. We now have 41 states where veterinarians are either mandated or permitted to report animal abuse. And in 34 of those states, they're immune from civil and criminal liability for doing that. Minnesota was one of the earliest ones to come on board. Again, very socially progressive state. And Minnesota vets are mandated to report suspected animal abuse. And they do have immunity for doing that. By the way, we have 18 states in which everybody is a mandated reporter of, of suspected child abuse, but animal control officers, veterinarians, um, people in the human, from the animal field don't know that. So we need to be reaching out to them and just give them an introduction to child abuse, what to look for and who to report to. I whimsically call these doggy witness protection programs because these topics get pretty heavy and a little humor sometimes help. They started out with what we call safe havens, foster care programs where domestic violence shelters partnered with outside agencies, animal shelters or vets or other groups to provide offsite foster care for the surviving the pets of domestic violence survivors. There's still a lot of them out there. But the next step forward is pet friendly shelters. Andrew mentioned this group before, safety. Uh, Allie Phillips in Michigan developed this program. It's called Sheltering Animals and Families Together. There's her website. And she has a training manual and helps domestic violence shelters build facilities. There are several different models on how to do that uh, to accommodate the pets of uh, domestic violence survivors. There are about 290 in the U.S. right now, plus several more in other countries. There are five that we know of in Minnesota, in Aitken, Brainerd, uh, Duluth, Rochester, and St. Cloud. If you go to Allie's website there, you get more information about those specific agencies and also um, how to create uh, a similar program in other communities in Minnesota. Um, there are now several online portals where a survivor trying to escape and needs somebody to care for their pets can find either a safe haven or a safety program. Uh, Red Rover, Andrew mentioned them, they have safeplaceforpets.org. It's a great resource. They have one of these portals. Um, and they also have an online training manual like Allie does for how to build these facilities. Red Rover is also offering grants they're partnering with Purina to domestic violence shelters to house, uh, to build facilities for pets. Andrew mentioned the Animal Welfare Institute, awionline.org. They have a safe havens mapping project um, in another portal where somebody can look at um, a zip code or a name of a community and find one of these domestic violence shelters and may accept pets or at least have a foster care program. Third group out of Arizona, domesticshelters.org has a similar program as well. They're great resources. The FBI does not investigate animal cruelty. That was a misconception that was picked up by the media, unfortunately, but because of the animal abuse human violence link, and because we didn't have any data on how many cases of animal cruelty there are, because animal cruelty is handled exclusively on the local level by local agencies with no statewide coordination and no national coordination. And Minnesota is a real complicated system where you have Humane Federation of Minnesota and other agencies um, you know, jockeying for position in terms of who has authority in different areas. There's no real central plan. In other states, it can be as many as 600 different agencies that are supposed to investigate animal cruelty. So we don't know what the numbers are. But in 2016, we were able to convince the FBI 
to add four types of animal cruelty into their new national data system. It's called NIBRS, the National Incident-Based Reporting System that 18,000 law enforcement agencies use. This data is starting to come in. There are gaps in that system, which I don't have time to go into, but we're starting to get some numbers um, about simple neglect or gross neglect of animals, that's animal hoarding, physical abuse of animals, uh, organized abuse, that's animal fighting, or animal sexual abuse. So that's a major step forward. By the way, I mentioned the lack of statewide data. Minnesota is the only state I've come across in which the uh, central courts agency, and I forget the uh, name of the agency immediately, has data on how many pet protection orders were issued. And I saw that for the first two or three years of the program. I haven't seen any numbers since. I don't know if they're still out there. Um, but there were a lot of them, a lot of people in Minnesota take advantage of the pet protective order system. We have programs of courtroom animal advocates modeled after CASA, if you will, with court appointed pro bono attorneys representing the animal's interests because the animals can't speak for themselves in court. And we have Connecticut, Maine and Rhode Island having that system. We'd love to see Minnesota do it as well. And we now have a large number of therapy dogs that are trained to work in courtrooms uh, and children's advocacy centers to provide emotional comfort and support to these kids who've obviously been through tremendous traumas. They're in 40 states. The group uh, handling this is out of Seattle. It's courthousedogs.org. Great resources. I suspect there are any number of these uh, in Minnesota as well. Milwaukee came up with a novel program they decided the best way to stop domestic violence was that people report animal cruelty to 911. And they trained the 911 workers to start asking about animal cruelty cases. And it was a cooperative community program between the domestic violence agency, the police department, the prosecutor's office, the Wisconsin Humane Society, the domestic violence shelter, and a PR firm. And these very graphic photos and billboards throughout Milwaukee saying, you know, report animal abuse, you'll stop domestic violence uh, abuse, you'll know, save a life and maybe even two. Great website, check it out, spotabuse.org. It's a campaign that could be run in Milwaukee, in Minneapolis or St. Paul or uh, anywhere else in Minnesota. Um, many people just don't think of the animals. The Baltimore Police Department a number of years ago was ready to start their first victim services program. And the woman who headed this program came to one of our link trainings and said, look at this great poster we're about to put across, uh, across Baltimore. Showed a woman and a child cowering in the corner, the perpetrator looming over her saying, love shouldn't mean fear if you're having a problem called the police department. Well, the light bulb went on in her head and uh, she came away from the program and said, oh, what did I forget? And through the wonders of Photoshop, they were able to insert a dog in the poster. Okay, remarkably simple solution. Once you turn that light bulb on and get people to automatically start thinking about this. What can you do as a child advocate? I'm not sure what position you folks are in, but some you know, suggestions here, okay? If you're doing child welfare checks or managing cases, particularly going out to the home environment, okay? Look for potentially abused or neglected animals. Look for potentially dangerous animals. Snakes, reptiles, aggressive uh, animals, dog fighting and cock fighting equipment, uh, animals that are infested with parasites, fleas and ticks, okay? Again, you don't have to be an expert on that. If it's common sense stuff that you wouldn't do to your own pet, make a call and I will tell you who to call here in a second. Um, again, don't have to be an expert. Bring in somebody from the local animal welfare agency to talk to your people to explain what they need, um, what to look for and include you know these potential threats to the child's well-being in any evaluation of their living environment their lifestyle and other risk factors and a history of animal abuse may have evidentiary importance at a court trial in a disposition a custody hearing visitation rights uh, removal from the home and protection orders and a turbulent history of frequent turnover of animals may very well signal the family's inability to make la lasting emotional attachments. Include the child's emotional attachment to pets as a protective resiliency, a factor for resiliency. Don't dismiss the death or disappearance of the, the pet 
Don't trivialize it saying, oh, you'll get another cat, okay? We have to grieve for them and go through the same five stages of death and dying uh, that Kub uh, Margaret Google Ross wrote about years ago, okay? And identify the fact that witnessing or causing the abuse or death of an animal can be traumatic for that child. Most people don't know who to call in their community because the child, the animal protection system is so damn fragmented, okay? So we created a, a resource. If you go to our website, nationallinkcoalition.org, you'll find 51 pages, state by state, a list of who to call in each state by county, okay? And then often cities within those counties of who is supposed to investigate animal cruelty. We call this campaign, who are you gonna call abuse busters, okay? Because there is no coordination. You don't have to prove it. You just have to suspect it. Report it to that appropriate agency. Let them investigate and recognize that like any other criminal procedure, it needs evidence. It needs witnesses. It needs exact times and places and locations. Okay. Child protection people often tell me, hey, I got confidentiality constraints here. That's nonsense. That confidentiality can be waived if you're reporting to another law enforcement agency or you suspect there's another crime or if the welfare of the client, others in the household is threatened. So you can make a report. And we encourage establishing that line of communication with the appropriate agency in advance. There may not be a case happening now, but when one pops up three or four months from now, we'll know who to call and it won't be as scary to call them at that point. So in conclusion, I wanna leave a couple minutes here for, for questions. I know we got started a little late. A couple key premises. Animal abuse also hurts people. It's not just an animal welfare issue. It is a form of family violence. We need to consider it an adverse childhood experience that impacts the health and well being of children. A multidisciplinary, species spanning response is a much more effective and holistic and encompassing way to help families. Link based programs can create safer homes for children, families, and their pets and there are enhanced benefits of humans and animal victims recovering together. So there's our website again, nationallinkcoalition.org. If you'd like to get our link letter, just send me an email. Just make sure you include uh, the name of your organization there in your signature. Uh, there's no charge. You won't get spammed or anything like that. Um, Margaret Mead also said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. So I'd like to leave it on a positive note there. And I'll turn it over to Rich there, I guess. And um, I haven't been able to see if there are any chat questions there. So Rich, if you can monitor them for me and uh, be more than pleased to take some questions. Thanks, Phil. That, that was really great. I really appreciate it. I never got kind of the full treatment in terms of seeing your whole presentation and that just had a ton of facts. So we're going to take the video and it, if you'll give us the slides, if that's all right, we'll, we'll put mm -hmm. the website. Um, I don't see anything in the chat room. We've got, um, let's see, about 12 minutes before there's some automatic thing that just sends us back to the, the main room. So I welcome any questions you might have and please just jump in. Un unmute yourself and go for it. Uh, Phil, this is Judy Schumacher. Um, Hi. Hi, I'm really into figuring out what we can actually do to change things in Minnesota. Um, and I really like this spotabuse.org idea, um, creating public awareness. Um, that, that seems very practical. Do you know when, do you know anything more about it? Do you know when it was uh, started? Do you know how effective it's been? Uh, I could tell, I don't know off the top of my head, I can find out when it was started. I want to say it's about 2016, 2017, sometime around then. Uh, I have not heard anything from them in quite some time. So I don't have any um, uh, information as to how effective it has been. But if you okay. go to the website, there might be some contacts that you can get in touch with. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I know the names of the agencies. You can do the same thing in uh, wherever you are in, in Minnesota, and just pull something together. The key to that was uh, training 911, and that was the novel approach there. Um, so that would involve getting to the 911 agency in. Um, uh, to be, what do you mean, training 911? To be to aware ask, that you mean? Yeah, 
you know, uh, to report animal, to get animal abuse cases reported to 911 as a okay. way to prevent domestic violence. Okay, okay. great. Because Milwaukee, Thank like so many other cities, there were just so many agencies investigating animal cruelty, there was no central number. So, okay. so they centralized it through 911. Houston has done something similar and they created a central hotline. Uh, Houston's got five major animal shelters, not to mention oh. shelter groups, okay? Thank you, great. So, so to follow up on that, so what I think is happening, probably a lot of people do just pick up the phone and call 911 if they see an animal abuse. And what you're saying is that maybe most of the 911 uh, centers don't really know what to do with that, or you know, they give them a number and it turns out to be something on the side of town or whatever, right? Uh, I don't know how many people call 911. Um, I think they'd be more inclined to call uh, Humane Society, maybe the police. And again, if you look at you know our national directory on the website, you'll see how many different types of agencies can be involved. And particularly in Minnesota, where you have uh, two statewide agencies that um, you know have authority to do it. Um, an interesting study in Manitoba, uh, which is North Minnesota, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, a number of years ago, the Veterinary Association did a study there. And they asked people who would they call to report suspected abuse. And not surprisingly, in a highly rural province, okay, the majority of people would call their veterinarian as opposed to the police or the humane mm -hmm. society. Okay, because in a small community, the vet may be the only you know, person they think of that has any familiarity with animal issues. Then another problem is in, in rural areas, and you know, northern Minnesota is a classic example. You know, the sheriff has to control, you know, patrol, you know, huge area. And, you know, for sheriffs anywhere around the country, animal abuse is not a priority, you know, and uh, they're understaffed. And we've been working with the National Sheriff's Association to build awareness with them. We're now working with a small and rural law enforcement agency. Um, um, so, um, I'm sorry, small and rural law enforcement executives association to try to bring awareness uh, to those communities as well. So Phil, I have a question, unless somebody else wants to jump in, I'll, I'll uh, make way, but um, you know, this is a little bit of a sensitive issue or it's kind of tricky how to explain it, but in, in talking about this conference with um, domestic violence folks uh, and in talking about issues generally over the last several years, I've found kind of a wariness about um, working with child protection or working with uh, animal regulatory organizations. And the best that I can say, and I'm not sure I understand all, exactly why, but that, what my understanding has been as well, we want the one, we don't want to blow the woman's cover, basically. We don't want to have somebody come in and report the domestic uh, abuse and then, you know, really bad things happen. Right. Or uh, we want the woman to make the decision herself, usually the woman, uh, to, uh, to make that move, you know, and decide, okay, I've had enough. And um, the problem is obviously that doesn't, you know, the child is uh, is left in that situation and is likely to be, uh, you know, at least mostly hot, more likely physically and sexually assaulted. That is a huge issue. And it's not just Minnesota. We, we hear that all over the place. In fact, I was looking at a uh, pet friendly domestic violence shelter in, in New York State uh, a few years back and a veterinarian who'd done consulting on how to build the cages raised that very same issue couple of points about that. First, child abuse is mandatory reporting. Elder abuse is mandatory reporting. So that eliminates that whole argument. You just have to do it. With domestic violence, okay, it is a voluntary self-reporting issue because it's assumed that the woman has agency and she can make that report, okay? So there is understandable reluctance to try to uh, report it. What we do is we encourage her to escape and to make a safety plan to be able to escape. And let's put that literature about domestic violence in veterinarians' offices and animal shelters and let them know who they can contact and who they can talk to to help them make that decision. The other part of that is that we're encouraging the fact that, yes, this could put you at more risk. And the most dangerous time, I think Andrew mentioned this, you know, for her is when he leaves or threatens to leave. A huge issue. But the fact is, if you keep enabling him to do this, it's only going to get worse. He's not going to get better. Uh, and if he's hurting harmless animals, it's not 
the cat's fault. It's not your fault. It's his fault. And you really need to make a safety plan and get out of there because it will not get better. Well, I think the rub is resistance to people coming into the home who might report child abuse. Um, you know, and the idea that, for example, with animal regulatory people, cross-training them to recognize, uh, you know, child abuse or domestic violence, but I'm talking child abuse at the moment, um, that there, there wouldn't be, a, you know, I don't think a lot of interest in cooperating or, or working across those lines. So um, one of the things Andrew says is that animal abuse often gets reported about a year before domestic violence. And so we would have, you know, in terms of protecting the child, you'd have you know, maybe a good long lead time and, and time to you know, protect that child before they're so emotionally abused, and especially infants and toddlers while they're in their de you know, early development phases. That time is critical. And if we can um, respond to the, the danger or the damage that's being done to the child sooner, you know, we ought to do that. So I guess I'm thinking we, you know, we really need to have that conversation uh, between uh, intimate partner, uh, you know, violence people and, and and everybody else to figure out how we can manage that. Yeah, I mean, my response to that is, we have any number of mandated reporters of child abuse, okay? And they've been around since the 1960s and the 1970s. You know, so getting teachers to report suspected child abuse, okay? Um, yeah, it's the threat to the whole family. It could take the child away. It could disrupt the family unit and all that. But, you know, it's believed that reporting is better than not reporting. There's no reason why animal welfare, animal control personnel shouldn't be in that same uh, category. Secondly, as Andrew says, the lead time on that is long. So if we have reports of animal cruelty, um, the child abuse agencies can should be able to cross-reference that information and be able to find out, you know, when they're investigating a case, say, you know, ask the animal protection agency have you had any interaction with this family um and if they say yeah well that's an immediate you know additional risk factor that's going to enter into uh the decision of what the child protection agency is going to do but in order to do that they have to be willing to call the agency uh, call the animal protection agency ann olson i think was supposed to be doing one of these workshops here today she's with animal folks in minnesota she's also a great resource um, on all of this. And she's written and published extensively, particularly uh, manuals for veterinarians on how to get involved with this. Yeah, and we've talked with her. Uh, I see there's a question from uh, Lolita Johnson. I wonder if you could respond to that or a comment. Yeah, and I, and I can add a little bit more detail to that too, Rich. Um, I'm Lolita Johnson. I work for Minnesota Child Welfare Training Academy Curriculum Supervisor. And I wanted to just, um, make sure, you know, mandated reporters are required to report suspected um, abuse, maltreatment. But I also wanna just make sure that we are also saying that critical thinking also comes with that because we see issues and problems with reporting um, that has um, connected to the removal of children when they shouldn't have been either. So I think there's some of both in the same because of the, the internal biases that come in that, um, you know, addresses the inequities that we find here in Minnesota for the Black and Native children. Mm -hmm. It's an issue, not just in Minnesota, but nationwide. So I think before we say, you know, you must report suspected maltreatment, of course, but it also comes with pausing um, to do some critical thinking. And I, I appreciate the, the pet side of it because I certainly understand it. I understand where you're coming from with that. I think it it is a linkage and I, and I agree with that, but I also agree that we still have a huge issue with how we show up in homes, child protection workers is what I'm referring to, and the internal biases that come with that. And are they really truly, you know, is there enough training for them, which is what is part of my big job. I don't have a magic wand, but <laughs> trying to get them trained a little bit more um, to see that this is, you know, this is going to impact a family, um, but not jumping the gun and, and reporting because I think your pet hasn't been um, uh, shampooed in a few months. Um, you know what I mean? So I, it, it still takes some critical thinking and pausing because we do have 
uh, racial disparities and disproportionality that comes with the system that we're under and policy and practices has a lot to do with that, as you all know. I dealt with this in, in New Jersey, Lolita. I did training um, for New Jersey Child Welfare Training Partnership, and I'm glad to see that Minnesota has a similar one. Uh, New Jersey brought, uh, changed their process to bring in outside speakers to do the, the training uh, curricula, uh, just so they weren't just hearing from their own people over and over again. And I probably did two dozen trainings across New Jersey uh, over a number of years until I moved out of, uh, out of New Jersey. Um, I can't address the, uh, and the racial and, and uh, ethnic disparities in, in the system, I agree with you completely. Uh, we don't have a, a magic answer for that um, either. Breakout room is gonna close here shortly. Uh, but I'm just saying, you know, if we give the information, you would just include that among all the other things you're doing to improve their training and their awareness and their critical thinking, okay? And you add the animal issue into the other factors that affect that decision as opposed to just ignoring uh, the animal. A absolutely. And, and this is a nice golden nugget of information to include um, as we create our case scenarios for we're creating new worker training. So mm -hmm. this will be a nice nugget of information to include. So I appreciate it. Thank you. If I can help, just email me. I'll give you all sorts of material. And, Thank you. Uh, me too as well, Alita. Well, we're just going to get rudely <laughs> closed down in a few seconds, but thank you all for being here. And thanks, Phil. All right. Well, I, I see everybody's un, is muted, but I think I'm unmuted. Is that sound right? Does people hear me? Okay. Well, I'm not going to just take a lot of time, but I do want to thank our presenters. Uh, I actually sort of was able to be at two uh, at the same time. And then, you know, of course, Andrew's opening thing, we had some great questions. Um, and I just really appreciate everybody coming and, and uh, just really have a lot of admiration. One of the things that really got us to do this is, uh, you know, being inspired by every one of the speakers here and the work that they're doing and also the work that many of you are doing, and I know some of you, so uh, that, that gave us the, the energy and the juice to, to pull this together. Um, so I just wanna say in closing that, I hope this gets some conversations started. Um, I don't know for sure what kind of follow-up we're gonna to wanna to have, but I would really appreciate uh, all of you, especially people who are actively uh, in the field right now, uh, just sending us some emails with your reactions and thoughts and suggestions for next steps, because um, we're going to, you know, just try to figure out if there's something, you know, what would be next and what could we do to continue uh, having this conversation, exploring all these connections. Um, and so I think I will just leave it at that where, you know, uh, it's been a great morning. I really uh, got a lot out of it myself. I hope you did as well. I guess I would just say we're probably going to have several of the speakers back for webinars sometime in the next three to six months. So, you know, I think all of you probably get emails with our uh, about these webinars, or if not, just go to the website and, and sign up and, and you'll get our weekly blog. And that's where we have all of the, that kind of information. But we do webinars every two weeks, uh, 2.30 afternoon on Wednesdays, and um, they feature people like the, the folks that you've seen today, or sometimes I interview them, uh, or there's some new areas. And again, we've, we've kind of broadened out between just child welfare specific to uh, related areas, you know, based largely on the education from the folks you heard from today. So um, you'll be able to hear from those people again, probably these folks today in the next few months. And in addition, we're going to post the, uh, the PowerPoints and the recordings on our website if you want to go back and, and pick up that information. So just uh, send me or Stephanie any thoughts, questions, ideas, advice you have, and um, we'll, we'll see where this goes with your help. So thank you all so much for attending, and I uh, hope it was good for you. See you all. See you all soon.
Thanks, Rich and Stephanie. Okay, and thanks, Victor. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. That was great. And thank you, Stephanie. You figured it out. <laughs> yep, you bet. <laughs> all right, well, and thanks, Phil. I think you're still there. So, um, all right, well, we'll see you all at some time soon. Thanks a lot. Right. Thanks. Take care. Thank Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much.